computer. Okay, we're now recording and I now hand it over to Oliver who's going to talk about exploring information leaked by using the PageRank algorithm in an MPC setting. So over to you, Oliver. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I know that's a long, long title, uh, but we'll explain each and every bit of it as we go along. Um, I guess the first part is the, oh, or am I, there we go, uh, is the PageRank algorithm. Um, so when you go online, there are a lot of websites, um, billions probably. Uh, and on each of these websites are links to other websites. So each of them create uh, a, ne a network of sorts. Now, when you go to Google and you type in say puppies and you want websites that contain information or pictures or videos on puppies, Google presents you a list of things that contain puppies and it starts with the most interesting things first or the most important things first. Uh, and one of the methods by which it sorts that information so it gives you, uh, you know, the right things first is the page rank algorithm. Uh, it determines the importance of a website based on its relation to other websites. Uh, so here on the screen, we have an example, uh, smaller internet with a number of websites. Those are the bubbles uh, and a number of hyperlinks between the websites. Those are the arrows. Um, now you, you'll notice that the, uh, that the bubbles with more arrows pointing into them are larger and are therefore seen as more important by the page rank algorithm. Uh, why that is exactly, we'll get to in just a moment. Uh, but just know that that's the most important thing for the page rank algorithm. Uh, so how does page rank determine what is and what isn't important? Well, it models a random web surfer or the average web surfer. Most of the time when we're on a web page, we just click a hyperlink at random. And by most of the time we choose a probability alpha, usually uh, 0.15 and we take whatever's remaining. And that's the chance that we just click on a link at random. Uh, the remainder of the time, we're done with our with whatever thing we're doing on the internet, uh, and we just go to a random website. So we go to our search bar and we type in Google or Facebook or whatever. Uh, in our model, we teleport to any web page with equal probability, but there are some uh, which give Google or Facebook a higher probability of being teleported to, as would be the case in the real world. Um, and if we're at a dead end, so if we're at a web page with no hyperlinks, then we just teleport all the time uh, because there are no hyperlinks to click on. So now having this average web surfer, which websites are the most important? Well, they're the websites which this web surfer is more likely to be on. So the page rank score uh, of a website is the probability that this ran random average web surfer is there at any given point in time uh, for any given uh, starting point. A higher page rank score means there is a higher probability of our web surfer being there. Um, now, how do we apply this in a financial setting? So why would we want to do this secretly using multi-party computation? Uh, well, we can just replace websites with banks, or sorry, with bank accounts. That's a mistake in my slides. Uh, and we replace hyperlinks with bank account transactions. And that's it, we're done. Uh, the entire system works perfectly fine uh, doing that, the only thing is that bank accounts and account transactions are usually secret information uh, and not publicly available on the internet. So why would we want to do that? Well, uh, according to paper, a paper in 2016, uh, we can use the page rank algorithm to reduce false flags in fraudulent accounts. Uh, there are a lot of bank accounts and a lot of the things that are done with bank accounts are done uh, automatically by a computer. Uh, and that includes flagging fraudulent accounts. Uh, by using the page rank algorithm, we can reduce flagging, flagging you know, just normal accounts as fraudulent, which is a good thing for everybody involved. Uh, larger data sets, so more bank accounts, uh, increases the benefit by having more accurate data. Our uh, algorithm does better work. Uh, but doing that means that banks have to work together and they can't just send each other the data because that would be uh, a breach of several laws and also and also ethical you know concerns. So we're going to use multi-party computation to keep these inputs a secret uh, while we do the page rank algorithm. Um, a brief look at what multi-party computation is for the uninitiated. 
Uh, here on the left, uh, we have our parties, P1, P2, etc. And each of them have a piece of the input. So that would be alpha one, alpha two, et cetera. Uh, and they're going to take each of their inputs and uh, in the most, one of the more popular methods of uh, multi-party computation, they're going to just split their secret into tiny little chunks uh, so that when you recombine the chunks together, it gets your secret. They're going to send one piece of each of their secrets to everyone involved, keep one, keeping one for themselves. So everyone has one piece of everybody's secret. They're each going to perform uh, a form of the computation on the secrets. And then uh, with their part of the result that they get, uh, that becomes public and we smush all those together. And by the power of mathematics, uh, all, of our, uh, all of our hard work comes together with the answer. So all of this computation is done uh, secretly, and, or sorry, done secretly and in an encrypted fashion. In encrypted fashion. Uh, but even if all of this is perfect uh, and we get zero leaks on our secrets or on the method of computation, uh, there are still some issues. Um, a good way to look at that is to uh, look at how we assess multi-party computation security. Uh, one of the models for that is called the ideal world model. Uh, and the idea is that an MPC uh, method is secure if uh, any attack that works on it also works in the ideal world. The ideal world being everybody just hands their secret to a trusted third party, uh, a fictional trusted third party, the trusted third party turns around and behind, and so that nobody can see, does the calculations on a piece of paper somewhere, and then turns back around and hands us all the answer. Um, even in this ideal world scenario, there are still problems. So the runtime, uh, any peripherals can leak information about what's going on. Uh, and of course, the result gives us uh, an issue. So the most popular example of using multi-party computation is um, four wealthy bankers go to dinner and they want to determine who pays for dinner by seeing who has the highest salary. And of course, being wealthy bankers, they don't just want to hand out their salary. So they each split their salary into four equal or into four chunks, not equal chunks, because then you know the answer, into four chunks, uh, hand everybody a secret, do the multi-party computation and, it pick, and our multi-party computation picks a winner. Now, even if all of that is secret and we don't get the actual value of uh, the winner's salary, everybody knows that was not selected, that that person's salary is higher than theirs. And the person whose salary was selected knows that everybody else's salary at the table is lower than theirs. So just by producing a result, we leak information. Uh, however, we're more interested today in the runtime, just in how long the algorithm runs, produces information on what was input. Uh, if I ask the computer to calculate two plus two, that's going to be a lot easier, uh, a lot shorter than asking the computer to calculate uh, 37 divided or 37 divided by some astronomically large number. So now, um, so having said all that, we need to take a deeper look at the PageRank algorithm. Uh, and in order to do the, uh, in order to create our um, our probability of our web surfer being there, we need to model our web surfer using linear algebra. Uh, those of you familiar with Markov chains may recognize that this is just a Markov chain. Uh, so we go to our linear algebra store and we put together a shopping list. We need a matrix with the transition probabilities. We need a matrix where each entry is the probability that being at a, uh, where each entry is the probability that being at a certain website or bank account um, has this probability of in the next step being at the next, at this other website. Uh, so then each row is the transition uh, vector or the vector of probabilities for leaving a certain website. Uh, and then we need a vector with our current probabilities. So at this step, our current web surfer has a prob this probability of being at this website and this probability at this website, et cetera. And you'll notice that multiplying these two together, so our matrix by our vector gives us the vector of current probabilities for the next step. So after having clicked on a hyperlink or teleported at random. Um, putting together the vector is relatively simple. We just start with um, whatever starting point we want or probability of starting points we want and um, move it on step by step using our matrix. It's setting up the matrix, that's the hard part. So first, we need the adjacency matrix of our bank account network or of our website network. 
Uh, and in order to do that, we just use uh, the adjacency. Yeah, so the adjacency matrix. Uh, our network is actually a mathematical object called a graph. Uh, a graph has two things in it. It has nodes, which are the dots with, or with, which are the circles with numbers in them. There are five of them, one, two, three, four, and five. And it has edges. These are the arrows connecting our nodes. Uh, so in our internet, uh, in our internet analogy, the nodes are the websites, and the uh, edges are the hyperlinks. Now our adjacency matrix is uh, almost as I said before. It contains a zero at a spot if there is no edge uh, going from the row, the row number node to the column number node, and it has a one uh, if that is if there is such an edge. So here there is no edge going from one to itself, but there is an edge going from one to two. So we put a one in there. Um, now, because we're working with probabilities, we need this matrix to be stochastic. And if we go back, we'll notice that uh, node number four here has two edges leaving it. It has an edge going to three and it has an edge going to five, which means that this row uh, has two ones. So this will not uh, keep, this makes this matrix not stochastic. The rows don't add up to one, uh, which makes this vector that we're going to multiply by it no longer a probability vector. So we're going to make it stochastic. Uh, there's one other problem that we can run into, uh, and that is dangling nodes. Uh, here I've removed an edge, and now we have um, now we have node two, which has no outgoing edges. So we had we hit a dead end essentially. Uh, now, if we remember by our web surfer, they're going to teleport at random in every every time we hit a dead end. So this row of zeros we're going to replace by a row of ones first. We're just going to add in every possible edge because these two situations are the same for our web surfer. Either it hits a dead end and it goes to a web page at random, or there is a hyperlink to every web page, including itself, and it clicks on one at random. Uh, so we're going to put a one in those rows, and then we're going to normalize each row so that we get a stochastic matrix. Uh, we're going to call this matrix B for a simple, uh, just for ease of use. And you'll notice that here we get our one over two, so that this adds up to one, and these all become one over fives. Now, finally, we need to add in the teleportation probability. So remember, we had a probability alpha that our uh, web user would just teleport at random. Now, the probability of going to any website from any other website is the same. Uh, if we have n oh, websites. So now is live. Good, good, good. good. So now is live here, Barnums. Uh, if we have n, sorry, if we have n nodes, then each the probability of going to each spot from any other spot is one over n. Uh, so we're just going to take an n by n matrix where each element is one over n. Uh, and now we can put this all together to create our transition matrix for our web surfer. Uh, we have a one or one minus alpha probability that we just follow a hyperlink or teleport if we're at a dead end, and we have an alpha probability that we just teleport. Uh, all of this together is a stochastic matrix because B is stochastic and E is stochastic. And also we've added them together with a total of one. Uh, so we're going to get a stochastic matrix. And now we want the page rank vector. Uh, we want this to be independent of where our web surfer starts. Uh, so we want a web, so we want a vector V for which this holds. Uh, where the probability of being at any web page doesn't change if we then go to a different web page. Uh, you'll notice that this is just an eigenvector. We have an eigenvector for p uh, with eigenvalue 1. Uh, p has an eigenvalue 1 because it is stochastic. And the way we're going to do that, or the easy way to do that for a matrix this large, because we're going to have uh, a matrix with hundreds of thousands of rows and hundreds of thousands of columns, so we're going to use the power method. Um, we're going to start with an equal chance of being in any given spot. Uh, and we're just going to iterate this until stable. So until uh, xi and xi plus 1 are close enough together that it doesn't matter. Um, now, this is, not, this is where our uh, runtime comes into play. So uh, our friends here, uh, Daniele and Eunice, um, use the uh, Banach fix, yeah, the Banach fix point theorem to get this 
a little relation between our stopping criteria, so the criteria where xi and xi plus 1 are close enough together, um, and a number of other quantities. Uh, so there is that there's that relation there, and it follows pretty directly from the Benwick fixed point theorem. So here, epsilon is the stopping criteria. Uh, n, which is right here, is the step on which the algorithm terminates, which is where we're going to uh, see that runtime come into play. Uh, and this value q uh, is the second largest eigenvalue divided by the first lar largest eigenvalue, and then the modulus of that. So we have this relation between the stopping criteria, the step, which is a uh, public thing. This is just part of our algorithm, so everybody needs to know what this is. Uh, the step on which the algorithm terminates, uh, which we don't know directly, but we're going to get an idea of, and the second largest eigenvalue divided by the first largest eigenvalue, or at least the size thereof. So our runtime reveals info on uh, the number of steps we've taken. The number of steps we've taken reveals some information on uh, on the size of lambda 2 divided by lambda 1. But p is stochastic, so our largest eigenvalue our largest eigenvalue is one. So in fact, we've revealed some information on the size of lambda two. Now, the thing is, because we're trying to do all of this secretly, we need to know how much information does this reveal about our input? So how much does this information does this reveal about this big network of bank accounts and bank account transactions that we've put in to our page rank algorithm? Um, well, the first thing to do is just to calculate is just to make a bunch of random graphs. Uh, these were created by picking a number of nodes, uh, in this case, 1,000, which is the most that'll run on my uh, personal computer, and then picking uniformly randomly a number of edges between 0 and, in this case, um, 100, wait, 100,000? I think 100,000. So the maximum number of, uh, sorry, the maximum number of edges and then picking those edges at random from all possible edges. So these are two, uh, two sets of these um, generated. This, the one on the left is a more zoomed in variant of the one on, on the right. Um, and the first thing to notice is that we get two very different uh, groups of things here. So each of these dots is a graph. On the y-axis, we have the size of our second largest eigenvalue. And on the x-axis, on the x-axis, we have the density, or the number of edges divided by the number of nodes. So we see that we get this little, uh, this kind of hump thing, uh, starting at zero, getting a maximum at around two, and decreasing quite steadily all the way up until the maximum value. Uh, but also towards the low end, we get, get this weird line of a bunch of graphs, which all have the se same second largest eigenvalue of 0.15, which is the teleportation probability that we chose. Um, so one of the things that we're going to look at uh, is what determines whether a graph is down here on this, what I'm going to call the hump, uh, or up here with uh, at 0.15. Now, uh, another thing that is interesting uh, that we're also going to look at is the uh, average path length compared to our second largest eigenvalue. Um, but first we have to explain what the average path length of a graph is. First, a path is um, a series of edges starting at one node and ending at another. So a path from two to one might go two to five to one, but it might also go two, five, one, two, five, one. As long as you're following the edges in the correct order and you're not reversing edges, then you're fine. Uh, it doesn't, it just has to start at one and end at the other. Uh, the path length, uh, is the number of edges in your path, or uh, once we've uh, stochast made our matrix stochastic, then it's adding up all of those values. Uh, so if we took a path from four to five here, this edge, if you'll recall, uh, was a 0.5 or a one half in our matrix. So this path would have a path length of 0.5. Uh, the distance between two nodes is the shortest path. So it's the path with the short, or it's the sorry, it's the length of the path with the shortest length. Uh, so while a path from four to three may go four three four three, that's not the shortest one. The shortest one would be four to three. So this distance would be a half. And the average path length is 
the averages of all these distances that exist. So if there is no path between those two, um, between two nodes, then the distance is zero. Uh, and we're going to ignore that for our average path length. So this average path length um, or weighted average path length, if we're using the values in our stochastic matrix, which we are doing here, um, is on the x-axis here. And our second largest eigenvalue is on the y-axis. Uh, again, we get this line at 0.15, uh, but this is quite nearly for the remainder. So the ones, these are all the graphs that were on the hump earlier. Uh, this is almost a linear relation. Um, so while I haven't found a, uh, a proof that this is, so it's not linear, it's linear plus some others, some other factor. Um, but this should be something that we, uh, could be proven in the future that this is a uh, closer relation. But back to uh, dividing these two groups from one another, because that seems to be uh, the largest the largest thing. Yeah, so we want to divide these two groups. What makes a graph be on this hump and what makes a graph be on this line? Um, well, first we need to look at the structure of a graph. Um, a Graph is called strongly connected when there are paths in both directions between any pair of nodes. Uh, so this, this graph is not strongly connected, uh, but for example, if we were to ignore nodes three and four, one, two, and five are strongly connected because between any pair of these, there is a path going in each direction, which is also the concept of a component. If a graph is not strongly connected, then a component is a um, maximal strongly connected subgraph or part of the graph. So here, one, two, and five is a component because adding four or three makes there not be a, a path going from one, two, or five to either of those. And three and four together is a component uh, because adding any of these would cause there to be, there would be a, um, a path going from four to the others, but not in the reverse. Uh, a component is called closed when there is no escape. So basically once, so one, two, and five is closed because once uh, our random web surfer is in here without teleporting, there is no escape. They're just going to bounce between one, two, and five forever. Three and four is not closed because there's an escape via four, two, five. Uh, within a component, we can talk about a period. Uh, the period is if we're taking each edge as being length one um, is the greatest common denominator uh, between paths from uh, between self loops. So between paths from a node to itself. So over here between one, two, and five, each path from a node to itself is always divisible by three. So the period here would be three. Uh, over here at three and four, any self loop is always of period two or is always of a length divisible by two. So our period is two. Uh, now we're going to get to two theorems that were actually on Markov chains, but which can be very uh, easily uh, translated to graphs uh, in our specific scenario. Uh, this is a lot of text, uh, but we're going to break it down in just a moment. Um, so if we have an eigenvalue for our adjacency matrix and the size of that eigenvalue is one, then that eigenvalue is a root of unity. Now, um, a close, there's a closed component of period D, so with a period with a period equal to D, if and only if the dth roots of unity are eigenvalues. Uh, so that means that, uh, for example, the third roots of uh, the third roots of unity are only eigenvalues if there is a closed component of period three. Uh, and on top of that, the multiplicity of these components uh, of these roots of unity is equal to the number of closed components with period D. Uh, but for our purposes, that won't be important. Now, on top of that, um, the multiplicity of one as an eigenvalue is equal to the number of closed components of the graph. So what we get from both of those uh, is that for the, sorry, for the adjacency matrix of our graph, the second eigenvalue has uh, a modulus of one if either there are multiple closed components in this graph or if there are, or if there is a component, closed component with a period of two or higher. 
Uh, and the final bit of that is for our page rank matrix. So the matrix that we put together from the stochastic adjacency matrix and the um, teleportation matrix. The eigenvalues are just one and then our teleportation probability multiplied by the remainder of the eigenvalues of our stochasticized uh, adjacency matrix. So this means quite directly uh, that we're in that line if either of those two things hold. So if our, um, if our modulus of our second eigenvalue is our teleportation probability, or in the case of our experiments, 0.15, then this happens if and only if either our graph has two closed strongly connected components, or um, it has a closed strongly connected component with, um, with a period of larger than or equal to two. Um, so then we have uh, essentially the entirety of the information leaked for these graphs. So for the graphs on this line, that's what is leaked. Either, um, either it has a closed connected component, sorry, a closed component with period of two or greater, or it has multiple closed components. So now what remains for, the, for this other group, for the group on the hump? Well, it has one closed component, and this component has a period of one, because if either of those things were false, then we would be on the line again. But what else can we say about that? Well, the interesting thing to look at is the structure of the adjacency matrix, or how we can structure the adjacency matrix. By renumbering our nodes, so here we've swapped the numbers of three and five, so that our closed components are together, uh, number-wise, and our uh, other components are at the end, we can get this kind of matrix. So we have a box. We're going to have a box for each closed component, uh, which is itself a stochastic matrix because they are closed. There will be no, uh, no exit. So all of, the, uh, all of the edges leaving nodes will be within this box in the matrix. Uh, we'll get a box in the bottom right for each of the nodes that are not within a closed component uh, between themselves. And we'll get a box in the bottom left from uh, components which are not closed to components which are closed. Um, so now what can we do with that? We have this kind of triangle, this triangle block matrix form with zeros in the top right. Uh, well, the interesting thing is when we have a matrix of this form, um, the eigenvalues of this matrix are eigenvalues of either of the corners. So if, there, if then, ugh, a number is an eigenvalue of B, if and only if it's an eigenvalue of either C or of Q here, so of the top left or of the bottom right. Um, so now we're going to just look at this Q because we can do uh, an interesting thing with that. We can prove that all of its eigenvalues are zero. Um, so in Horn and Johnson, uh, this is probably a much, much older uh, theorem. You can find that if we take a matrix norm uh, and we take the limit of uh, a matrix going to, uh, going to infinity, so if we take this for the limit going to uh, of k going to infinity, then this is equal to the upper bound for the modulus of the eigenvalues, um, known as the uh, spectral radius of a matrix. So if we can prove that this goes to zero, that means that the upper bound for the modulus of eigenvalues goes to or is zero, which means that all the eigenvalues are zero. And uh, on in a book on uh, on Markov chains, we get this theorem, that the limit of just the power bit goes to zero element-wise for, uh, for this matrix that we want. So combining those two, all of the, so combining those two, all of the eigenvalues of Q are zero, which means that the second largest eigenvalue uh, is either zero because this contains all but one, uh, all but one node, or we have it as the second eigenvalue of a primitive matrix. And what a primitive matrix is, is it is essentially the uh, adjacency matrix for a closed aperiodic component. Uh, its property, its special property is that there is a power for which every entrant, uh, sorry, every element of the matrix is greater than zero. Um, so having, all of that, we have that group one has, or the line 
is uh, exclusively elements or exclusively graphs with two closed components or a closed component with uh, a period of two or greater. And we have that the second group has uh, just the primitive matrix, this little primitive matrix or the uh, structure of our closed aperiodic component, which determines our second largest eigenvalue. So this determines what information we've leaked. So the information we leak is actually entirely based on our closed aperiodic component and has nothing to do with any other state or any other node within our graph, which means a large number of graphs can leak exactly the same information. Um, but in order to try and bound this, or another tool in order to try and bound this a little better is a pseudo spectrum. Uh, so the idea is a pseudo spectrum is a set containing all of the eigenvalues and almost eigenvalues of an operator. Uh, recall matrices are operators, so we can just use these, use this concept for matrices. Um, so the original idea, I believe, was when calculating the eigenvalues of a matrix um, using a computer, some of the values will be slightly perturbed. So we want to know what other possible uh, values we can get. We want to see whether this, um, whether this problem is well conditioned. Um, so having perturbed our matrix a little, we want to see what all those possible values are. So we pick an epsilon, uh, so the maximum value of our perturb perturbation, and we get a uh, and we get a set. Now, how can we use this for our purposes? Well, we're going to choose a matrix which we know to be in group two. So in our hump, we're going to calculate its eigenvalues. Uh, then we're going to calculate um, the largest epsilon so that our pseudo spectrum, um, I've written this down improperly, so that our pseudo spectrum um, forces any matrix that is at least, that is at most epsilon far from our matrix to have lambda two less than one. Uh, so by having, because, uh, because eigenvalues are continuous, if we have a set which has one in a separate spot as where lambda two begins, then it cannot travel to one or to any other spot. Uh, yeah, so that it cannot travel to uh, modulus one. Um, I've lost my train of thought. All right, so for our purposes, we're going to choose, uh, sorry. So having chosen a matrix in group two, we can then determine a range of matrices around it, which are then also in group two, so also on the hump using this method. Uh, the, most basic me the most basic idea is we choose our teleportation matrix because we get this at either end of our graph. So if we have a graph with zero uh, edges, then each edge is a dead end and everything will be connected. So because our uh, web surfer will teleport always, or if we're on the other end, each edge exists. So the chance of being uh, of going to any place from any place, teleport or no, is the same. Uh, so we and these two have eigenvalues one and then a whole bunch of zeros. So having this, we know our matrix is in group two, and in fact, we know exactly where that will be on our graph, uh, and we can calculate our epsilon for this matter, and it's zero point five. So if we have epsilon less than zero point five matrices, which by operator norm are less than zero point five away from our matrix E are automatically in group two. So they don't have an eigenvalue of 0.15. Um, so here we can illustrate that. So here all the way at the bottom left with density zero and second eigenvalue zero is E and matrices which are of operator norm uh, less than 0.5 away from it are also here on this hump somewhere. Um, we can actually take a look at the epsilon pseudospectrum of E to show you a little bit more of what I mean. Uh, each of these different colored circles uses a different epsilon. Uh, the epsilon is over here on the right. They are at values uh, 0 0.01 and then 0 0.05 away from that in steps. So we have 0 0.01 all the way at the center uh, and 0 0.06 here and 0 0.011 and so forth. Uh, and so what I meant by not having lambda 2 travel to uh, to one or to uh, 
uh, size one is we can see all the way up until uh, 0.46. So that's this, that's these circles here. Um, the set contained with, or the set shown by those doesn't contain a bridge between zero where lambda two you know, starts uh, and one where it would, uh, I guess, end. So because that's the case, anything within 0 0.09 of, um, of E by operator norm can't have this lambda two be uh, large enough to where uh, it would be a root of unity. So where we would get our closed component with period larger than two or our or a second closed component. Um, yeah, so yeah, so as I said, each graph with an adjacency matrix such that this uh, this distance is small enough is of group two, so is in our hump. To conclude, uh, I said a lot of things about uh, pseudo spectra, and I said a lot of things about these two groups. So let's just wrap everything up in a nice bow. Graphs fall into two groups. Either they have a um, second eigenvalue of modulus alpha, which means they have either two closed components, or they have a closed component with a period of two or greater, or they fall into the second group uh, with modulus of the second eigenvalue smaller than alpha, in which case uh, the second eigenvalue is determined entirely by the structure of this one closed aperiodic component. And we can use pseudospectra to bound these groups more accurately. Now, there are still things that we can do in the future. Um, for example, for uh, groups on the graph, what is this connection? How, um, like, why are these, why is the second largest eigenvalue and the weighted average path length so intertwined? Uh, is there a better connection between primitive matrices and the second largest eigenvalue? Can we make a connection between that? Uh, so that's a possibility for future research. And uh, using pseudospectra in this, uh, in this project, I've only done the pseudospectra um, for E all the way at the corner, but what happens if we take uh, a more systematic approach? So if we take matrices that are also in group two, but are not E, so for example, here or there or there, what matrices, can we create a sort of border between the two? Like what, is there a better way to use pseudospectra to bound group two than just this? Um, so yeah, this is another thing that we can do with uh, future research. And I believe that is all I wanted to say. Uh, so are there any questions? Well done, Seth. I'm going to um, give you a round of applause. There you go. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, yeah, any questions? Um, yeah, anyone uh, want to fire questions? Yeah. Um, I want to ask one uh, very quick question. Uh, a very, very uh, nice presentation. Thank you. And I, I, I want to ask you to go back to the Alden theorem. Yeah, give me one second. I don't know if I get the thing correct there. Where are we? Uh, Elden. <laughs> yeah, obviously the, uh, yeah, you shortened the Elden's theorem a lot here and I wanted, uh, I wanted to relate this to what he proved and uh, so if you could elaborate on what was the original, you know, this uh, stochastic matrix with eigenvalues one and then uh, the rest less than uh, one lambda two and lambda n. And then you have another stochastic matrix that you form yeah. from the first matrix. And then you have that relation that you have uh, written mm. there. If I remember yeah. Uh, so, um... I believe that it's uh, given a matrix of this form. So we have uh, a value alpha that we choose between zero and one. Uh, we have a stochastic matrix here. Uh, and we have a stochastic matrix. Um, sorry, we have one over n's here. And I believe this can also be multiplied by a vector um, or by a probability vector. Uh, 
uh, uh, okay, giving, so if this waiting is each that, row. Yeah. Uh, so if this is that, then uh, the condition is if E is the stochastic matrix with the uh, eigenvalues one followed by lambda two. No, it's we're still looking at B. Uh, so we have a stochastic okay. matrix B, which is the structure of our graph in this case, um, and then we have a possible we have a possibly weighted ver variant of this. Well, it was. Uh, where uh, each uh, I, 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 I can check his notes, but I, I remember it was uh, alpha times that base matrix and then one minus alpha and then uh, a non-negative, you know, vector multiplied with uh, a matrix formed by uh, the outer product of uh, a non-negative uh, matrix with a vector with the vector of all one elements, which no, would correspond to B. No, that corresponds to E. So, so some textbooks have it P equals one minus alpha B plus alpha E, and some textbooks yeah. have it P equals one minus lambda, uh, P equals lambda B plus one minus alpha E. Okay, okay. Yeah, so it's yeah. B is the structure of the matrix, E is what you're thinking of as the tra is the teleportation yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay so uh, this alpha, one minus alpha, I got yeah. confused there. Then. Yeah, half the literature writes it one way, half the literature writes it the other way. It's a bit confusing. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> But, but if alpha is zero here, yes. then P, P equals B, and then doesn't isn't your statement of Eldon's theorem then uh, wrong? Uh, alpha, alpha is never zero in the Eldon's theorem. Yeah, um, it's zero to uh, one uh, and not equal to zero and one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, but I just think that the conventions are different on the two slides. Yes. The yes. Alpha yeah. one yeah. minus that's, alpha. Convention. That's my mistake. There should be a one minus alpha in the other slide. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yes, maybe a quick question. So you started off uh, saying that uh, the research is motivated by applications in finance. Yes. But then somehow this, this didn't reoccur anymore at the end of your presentation. So can you explain a bit the uh, impact of what you did on, on, on the application? Yeah, so um, yeah, so when doing this in, uh, in finance, we have to, or it would, it's required to prove that your method doesn't leak uh, the information of people whose bank accounts you're using as this information. Um, so I think that the, uh, that the benefit of what we've done here is that we can prove that the information leaked is only based on the structure of the whole and very little on the, um, yeah, on the individual bank account. So while we do leak the structure of the entire bank account system, we don't leak anything on um, just individual, uh, yeah, individual's information. Any other questions? So yes, I have uh, a few oh, questions. So the first one is a bit of a silly one, but uh, could you go mm -hmm. back to slide 40? 40. <coughs> there we go. So since you quote, this is a theorem from this book, uh, is mm -hmm. this according to you a deep theorem or? No, what is it's, your not, opinion? it's not very deep. <laughs> uh, it's I, in fact, it's not even, it's, not even proven in this book. It's set as a problem in this book. <laughs> okay, I, I would. That's that, that's, that's the what I would give theorem. as a status that oh. this would be an exercise in first yeah. year linear algebra. But uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. But it's a thing we use, so I'm gonna put it in here as a slide. <laughs> uh, and and then maybe more substantially. Uh, so on slide twenty two. Uh, twenty two. There we go. So. Uh, there is clearly a certain pattern. So my question is now, to which extent are you aware of uh, more theoretical uh, limit distributions and limit results for say spectra of random graphs? And uh, there, there is a lot of, of work in that direction, yeah? Yeah, um, so I did do quite a bit of digging uh, on, this sort of, uh, on this sort of limit work, um, but nothing was directly uh, applicable here. Like it was all um, it all gave some problems somewhere along the line. So, um, 
in the sense that you cannot like literally confirm by uh, a theorem that's in the literature why you get this kind of shape but yeah. would you then on the other hand be able to make a certain conjecture yeah, a certain statement that you believe that in this and this regime uh, such and such random graph will have this or that property um No, not not really. Uh, the main issue is that this shape uh, changes based on the number of nodes in our graph. Uh, so, and we haven't done that for anything larger than a thousand, or I haven't done that for anything larger than a thousand, just due to uh, hardware limitations. Uh, and the graphs that we would be looking at would be uh, numbering with nodes in the hundreds of thousands, if not hundreds of millions. Uh, so. I'm just not sure what those graphs could or would look like. But, if, uh, but I think if you but go to the graph which had the, the linear relationship, I can't remember what slide it was on. Um, that there one. You go. Okay, but could you, would you, I mean, I, I'm putting you on the spot here. Um, would yeah. you conjecture that if you ignore the top line, that there is a kind of linear relationship? Yeah, I would even, um, I would even conjecture that uh, all this noise is due to the uh, non-closed components. So I would say that at least that at least a good number of this noise is based off of there being a non-closed component in our graph. And if we just took a closed aperiodic graph as a whole, that this would look a lot more linear. Okay. So if if we then go back to twenty one, because I still had uh, uh, a few questions. This one? Uh, this no, 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 22, sorry. Um, so uh, what you call density would be that on average, the degree of the graph? Uh... Um, yes. On, yeah, so on average, it would be the either the in degree or the out degree of the graph. Exactly. Uh, uh, so do you then have like a conjectural statement? Uh, there, there, there is clearly a graph of a function appearing here. Yeah, I mean... Uh, yeah. Uh, how is it? Do you have any idea on that? And how would that relate to the literature or? Uh... No. Um, no, nothing concrete. Isn't, isn't um, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't the spectra of random graphs usually undirected graphs? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so a lot of that. Um, information was in fact undirected graphs and that created problems when uh, transferring it to directed graphs. Sorry, it's been, has it been six months now? Yeah, sorry, it's been six months since I did that particular bit of research. Okay. So there isn't okay. much in the literature yep. about undirected graphs? No, it's a huge pain. Just ah. anything that you could want or need is always on directed graphs because they're easier with symmetric matrices. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, let's all give a round of applause again, virtually, if we want to do that. Brilliant. Okay. And um, what we'll do is we'll... Um,